This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. So this is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Dominic Swintoski, owner of Trout Bitten and author of TroutBitten.com. Today we're going to cover a topic that I've been writing about a lot lately. Uh, we'll talk about safe catch and release practices, um, from hooking a trout to letting it go. Because if the goal of catch and release is to put them back and to catch those trout again, then we want to ensure that the health of the fish remains intact. I suppose that some of the catch and release best practices are common sense. But the truth is, handling a trout without harming it isn't necessarily intuitive. It takes some forethought and preparation, really. You need the right tools, the right skills, and it takes a good understanding of how trout are built, or how they are a little more sensitive uh, or delicate than other species. I mean, every animal is different. For example, we just got back from a family beach trip where Joey, my oldest son, wanted to fish for shark. I don't know how to handle a shark. So I did some research beforehand. I also tried to prepare myself for accidentally catching a stingray, which we didn't want to catch. That's uh, another species I have no experience with. But, and I even remember the first bluefish we caught from the surf a few years ago. I cut my finger on those sharp teeth because I had no knowledge about a bluefish. Their teeth are a lot sharper than a trout's, I found out. So it helps to understand the species that you're fishing for and learn their habits if, if you plan to release the fish without harming it. Uh, there's a lot of nuance in topics like this, and we're going to dig pretty deep into the details today. At every level of experience, we're always learning and trying to improve or share ideas about the fish we chase. The trout pitting guys joining me today are full of ideas and ready to share some thoughts about how to handle a trout. So let's introduce him. All right, here's Bill Dell, a guy who travels a lot of miles in pursuit of wild trout. Say hi, Bill. Hi, all. What's up, buddy? Hey, Bill, what's the last fly, uh, what's the last fly that you caught a fish on? Green weenie about two hours ago. <laughs> nice. Was that a trout? It was a trout. It was a brown trout. There you go. Is a green weenie good for you all year round or when? Yeah, I can catch fish on it all year round. Is that right? Usually. When yeah. does it shine? When does it shine? Summertime. Same. When the when that little inchworm start to to drop, right? Motivate fish a little bit more. Do you think they take it for an inchworm all the time? No, I think it's one of my favorite flies in freestone streams because it's bright, it's easy to see. Yeah. And I think it just attracts fish and it's kind of fun. It's a fun fly to fish because you can you can sight fish it. Yep. Good stuff, dude. All right, here's Trevor Smith, a medical doctor and our resident expert on science. Math, too. I have no math skills. So, Trevor, you can handle any math that comes up tonight. <laughs> All right, buddy. Hey, Trevor, uh, what do you do if a trout won't commit to a topwater pattern at night? If a trout won't commit to a topwater pattern at night, I will probably switch over to a subsurface fly, and but not something that fishes too deep, something just under the surface. Um, but before I do that, I'll probably run the same surface fly a few more times over it and just play it either slower, do a different retrieve. Mm. Um, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes I just can't figure out what will get them to commit. But uh, a lot of times, just a different retrieve, a slower retrieve, or just some variance like that will get them to, to call the shot. I hear you. You ever a nymph at night? I have. I have. I have not been very successful at it. And a lot of that's because I haven't really committed to spending the time to do it well. But when I have, I have done it with a tight line with a glowing indicator kind of strip, just a, a pirated glow in the dark line that I nail knotted into my leader. And it was fun. It was definitely, it was different, but I, I've gone to it when I don't seem to find much success with other tactics. So I think I'm using it on some of the harder nights to begin with. Yeah, that's the thing. Because you're not mm -hmm. catching them the way, the way you want to catch them or that you expect to catch them. Mm -hmm. And then you go to something else. This is either nighttime or daytime. Yep. And then, you know, you start to either switch the fly or switch the tactic. And then you 
don't know and if it's I, that or if it's just the fish just aren't on. Right. And I think part of the reason I love night fishing is that it gives me the opportunity to fish in a totally different way than I fish in the day. So mm -hmm. while it would be fun if I did catch them on a nymph, tight lining, I think I'm just attracted to the other styles of night fishing. Yep. I like it, man. All right. Here's Josh Darling. Photographer, videographer, graphic guy, and owner of Wilds Media. Say hi, Josh. Hello. All right, buddy. Hey, what's your favorite species to fish for besides trout? Largemouth. I figured yep. being yep. from Illinois, right? Yep. You're from, had yeah. A, had a pond in our backyard, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where I grew up learning. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, what's your favorite way to fish for them? Uh, Topwater's the most fun. Man, those, they're, I mean, they're aggressive. Yeah. I have very yeah. limited... Are there large mouth in rivers? Uh, yeah. At times, yes, if they're large and slow. Mm. Bill says yes. Especially down south. Especially the rivers that we had around us, yeah. No kidding. I don't know if I've ever caught them in a river. We, of course, have smallmouth around here in our, in our rivers. And even this time of the year, once in a while, you go out and you catch, I don't know, sometimes a few smallmouth and uh, only a few trout. Yeah. I still like to do it on the fly, though. I know. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. I believe it. Hey, all right. Here's Austin Danjo, home improvement expert and brewer of craft beers. Say hi, Austin. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> a newly crowned home improvement expert. <laughs> Tell us why. Uh, I bought a 110-year-old home. And I <laughs> have been it. spending <laughs> every day of my life for the last couple months uh, doing some remodeling a little bit of renovations but enjoying the work yeah that's cool yep that first home mm. yeah i'll tell you what though when our first home we knew that we were not going to keep it right mm. seriously and so every home improvement i did i felt like i was well i knew i was doing it for somebody else so i just yeah i just did the minimum but right. i see that you're going the extra mile a lot of times yeah i plan on sticking around i know you do uh yeah. place for a while so it's cool. Do it now and I don't have to do it later. I hear you. Hey, dude, uh, how many flies do you carry on average? Um, I'd you say... like that one. Mm -hmm. Hurry up, yeah. do math. Ask Trevor. He'll help you out. Yeah. I need an <laughs> average. Um, I'd say for nymphs, I probably have, I don't know, 12 to 15 different nymph patterns that I always have. Uh, streamers, I keep about probably five different patterns, not a lot of different streamer patterns. And probably, you know, five to 10 different dry patterns overall. Um, so not a lot. So is that a hundred flies, 200 flies, 500 flies? Fast math. Uh, I don't know. Let's say, let's say 75 flies. Do you carry the no same kidding. group with you every time you go? The same group? Yeah. Same group of flies. Yeah. I mean, since I don't carry a lot, it doesn't weigh me down much. So I can carry all those flies kind of year round. Like my dry fly selection, I'll have it pretty slim. Yeah. Obviously when it's not peak hatch season, but I'll have it with me regardless. Mm -hmm. um, streamers, I always have like pretty much a solid baseline of inventory. Mm -hmm. And nymphs, I'm just always just trying to keep up. So however much I have is, is what I have. But <laughs> Hey, do you guys, this for anybody, do you guys um, sort of change up? the flies that you carry for the season or i will say like for me i just keep them all in there man i mean i almost always have the same stuff there'll be like some sulfur patterns that i'll add during sulfur season but for the most part everything is in my the last time i counted i don't know why i counted but i had 400 flies what do you guys do i think i rotate out maybe like 50 to 25 percent of my flies so like the there is like 50 percent that stays the same but winter to spring to summer i'm pulling out because i usually carry three or four small boxes and i'll be switching those smaller boxes out depending on the season hmm. the rest of you guys more similar to you dom i have two large boxes that pretty much house everything you know mm -hmm. i've got i've got a whole page of you know, mm -hmm. one fly that I'm most confident in, in different sizes and different weights and then yeah. a variety of others. But it's, it's really one box that has a plethora of nymphs and, and a little, uh, you know, a few dry flies and then one box that has streamers. And that it's always with me. Well, when we were night fishing the other night and I was talking to Trevor and you, Josh, um, I noticed like the, the nice small packs, the nice mm -hmm. small pack that Trevor had. And I'm like, Ooh, yeah, that'd be nice. So I have my whole vest and I have all kind of stuff in there that I was not going to use at night, but 
I'm just like, well, I've tried going that route and paring it down for, yeah. you know, brookie fishing or night fishing. And I just always yeah. feel naked somewhat uh, without, uh, without that weight on me. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I did the same thing last year. Smaller pack for the night. And, I, and I went I wanted a minimalist all the time. Yeah, I'll, Bill? Uh, I don't know. I, I bet you I don't carry more than 50 flies anymore. No kidding. Wow. Oh, my God. I'll, I'll keep, um, I guess, one box that has a little bit of everything in it, and then I'll carry a lanyard on the front. And it, tonight I had, I think I carried about a dozen flies with me. Woo. Wow. I'm serious. I admire that. Yeah. A lot of guys, you know, they, they have to have the full fly box. I've never felt that way. I've That's never had me. a box that was just jammed packed. That's me. And some people say, oh, it's because you guide. No, I've always yeah. been that way. I guide with exactly the same equipment as I fish with. But right. I don't know. I would very much love to pare it down to a dozen flies or 50 <laughs> flies, like you said. Man, I'm telling you, I got like, I got probably, a, probably 350 that I'm not going to use. And I know I'm not going to use them. We'll take them. We'll take them. You, right? <laughs> I'm to, not giving them away. <laughs> well, come on. <laughs> So I, so one, one, uh, footnote is that I do keep, uh, multiple boxes in the car that have about any and everything that I need. And so yeah. seen those boxes, mm -hmm. <laughs> those are impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, true. I've seen them. If, uh, if I go brookie fish and I'll just throw in a couple that I think that are going to work. And I don't know, my general philosophy is they don't eat it. Just move to the next hole. They're fine. Find yeah. a village idiot in the next run. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Especially when your your plan is to move and cover a bunch of water. Like I get that. Mm -hmm. The time I have been able to do it is exactly what you're saying. When I'm brookie fishing, I have actually just gone back to oh a creel that I had when I was in my teens. Literally, just an old school nylon creel, and I just throw a few things in there, including a water bottle. But that's I don't know. It, it, like Josh said, he tried it and then couldn't get comfortable with it. And um, anyway, I don't know if I'm ever comfortable. Make it, make it a game. Uh, see if you can catch more fish than flies you have. Oh, there you, there you go. That's good. <laughs> That's a good one. I think I just like the physical comfort of being light and kind of like, I don't know, like Bill said, that streamlined yeah. approach. I don't know. I, For sure. I favor that. For sure. I think that, oh, I've gone through spells before where I try to really pare stuff down. I always end up going back to the vest because I can stock it. And I can have everything up front, but I can, I can sense myself about to go through another phase where I'm trying to, uh, pare it down again. I'm a little slower when I tried it, you know, I don't know where everything is as well. I know, right. You'd think you'd be yeah. faster because you got more room to operate or, you know, less things yeah. to go through, but no, I'm slower because I don't have everything I need right where I need it. My split shot has been in, well, this pocket right here at my left hand. For my whole life. I mean, since There's I was dog treats there now, right? <laughs> that's on the right side. Oh, <laughs> over on the right. other side. Yeah. Yeah. And that's at night though. That, that's where the, uh, that's where the UV light goes now. Mm -hmm. That was Trevor's idea. Yep. All right. Let's take a break here and we'll get right back to it. Fooling Mill is the world's leading producer of flies, fly boxes, hooks, beads, and tippet. Known for their barbless hooks, they have many of your favorite trout patterns tied barbless. Not only that, they feature patterns from anglers like George Daniel, Pat Weiss, Josh Miller, Joe Goodspeed, and many others from around the world. Every pattern is backed by the 200% fooling mill guarantee. If a fly isn't up to the highest standards that you expect, they will replace it with two that are. Stock up at foolingmill.com or ask for their flies at your local dealer. All right, hey guys. All right, so let's do this. How to handle a trout or how to catch and release trout safely so they really do make it through the experience of being caught. So I try to practice what I preach, and I think the education is really the most important thing. So among all of the stories, commentary, and tactical pieces that I've written on Trout Bitten, I've also penned a bunch about this topic. Articles titled, How to Hold a Trout, They're Hard in Your Hands, uh, when is it too hot for trout? Taking the fish selfie. And I have a whole series of uh, articles about fighting fish because in truth, that's where it all starts. But let's start here. Let's break this down a little bit more. Uh, here are the 
sort of the guidelines for all of this. Uh, fish cold water, fight them fast, handle gently, release quickly. Let's do it again. Fish cold water, fight them fast, handle gently, and release quickly. Let's go over those tonight together. I think it should be pretty good discussion. And let's start with uh, fishing cold water. What's too hot for trout, guys? I'll say I'll say sixty-eight. Yeah. So I'll jump in here just because in preparation for tonight, I did a little yeah. bit of a deep dive into what I could find literature wise. And Trevor's the scientist. Was, yeah. Well, it was kind of fun for me because this is what I do with medicine um, on the topics that I, you know, treat people on in clinic every day. But the truth is, uh, there's a lot of um, variability in what I found research wise. Yeah. And there's a lot of breadth of. Um, studies that were done for different purposes that begin back in the 50s and 60s and go all the way up to about 2008, 2011 were more of the recent uh, studies I found. And um, there's, a, there's a wide degree of variability when you talk about what the research has shown for optimal brown trout survival. And I think a lot of that is because the question that you're asking is really important to define. And so yeah. when you look at the temperature that a trout can tolerate, specifically a brown trout, the studies that have been done often are looking at whether the fish exhibit signs of stress after either one hour in that time frame or a thousand minutes, which is about 16, 17 hours, which mimics a day in the life cycle of that trout. After or being caught, you mean? Not even after being caught. So there's very little studies that, that show anything that would resemble good data on the type of stress that the trout are dealing with based mm. on the temperature after caught being caught. Yeah. Um, the numbers just don't, aren't, aren't high enough to approach any sort of confidence in what you're looking at data wise. But yeah, all this to say, because it'll be easy to lose myself in it, but there is some consensus as far as the fact that brown trout prefer, they to they prefer certain temperatures, then they tolerate other temperatures, and then uh. there's a range of temperatures that become relatively fatal uh, to them uh, for extended periods of time. And that varies depending upon what part of the country you're in. So if you're in the Northern climates and hemisphere, um, even mm. North of Pennsylvania, um, some the brown trout there exhibit less tolerance for warmer temperatures. And as you move south in their range, there's some slight variation to warmer temperatures. Yeah. And as you can guess, there's probably been natural selection that's sort of dictated that over years as those brown trout have been exposed to different types mm -hmm. of temperatures in their waterways. Sure. I'm, not, I'm not talking about huge, huge variants of temperature, but, you know, trout in Pennsylvania might exhibit stress over 68 degrees trout in you know north carolina brown trout might exhibit stress over 70 degrees and okay. trout in canada might exhibit stress over 66 degrees you know so within a few degrees there is a range um, that's important to remember that's really interesting i don't think you hear that idea mentioned mm -hmm. very much it's more just a flat number for everyone in the world yeah right Never a conditional. So, so I guess my, one of the things I consider when I fish at different temperatures is what's the air temperature. Um, if you're, if you're pulling a brown trout out of 65 degree water and you're putting it into 95 degree air temperatures, that's a difference between pulling it out of 65 degree uh, water temperature and putting it into 70 degrees. But, you know, if you're, if you're holding it out of the water for, let's say, three or four seconds, I would think that air temperature takes it, has some sort of impact. I think, yeah, that's an interesting point and one that I didn't see talked about much. See, I, think, I don't. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know. I don't agree with that. I don't think that uh, the air temperature matters if you're handling, if you're handling the trout, like you said, three or four seconds. I'm going to say five seconds. I talk about that a lot. I think if it's out of the water for five seconds, I don't think the air temperature matters. I mean, if it was okay, if it was 150 degrees, yeah, that would matter. Or if it was zero degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> I think that might matter. But I don't know. 
I don't think it matters. I don't think at five seconds it matters. Now, if you're holding it out of the trout for 30 or out of the water for 30 seconds, I think that's a bad thing, obviously. And then that air, air temperature would really matter. I'd love to see data on that. Well, here's one one thing I did find in the research, and this goes back to the the question, why does cold water matter to some extent for brown trout? And a lot of it is the oxygen carrying capacity of yeah. that water. And so at nearing 70 degrees, 68, 70 degrees, you need five parts per million of oxygen dissolved into that substrate or into that water. And yeah. yet the warmer water gets, the less oxygen it will actually hold. And so it's sort of a double-edged sword as you get into higher temperatures because the trout needs a higher oxygen percentage and yet there's mm -hmm. a less available one there. And so I don't, I kind of tend towards your perspective, Dom. I don't know that the air temperature matters a whole lot if you're keeping the time to five seconds yeah, uh, because that doesn't dictate the water temperature uh, and, and the dissolved oxygen. But it mm. does matter. And what they did find was that the water temperature that you're releasing that fish into does have a role in the likelihood of that trout surviving after being caught. And so, as you can imagine, if you fight mm -hmm. a fish for a lot longer and tire them out and you're trying to revive them in 72 degree water, oh, yeah. that's a difficult, difficult process and one that is very different than reviving that trout in 60 degree water. For sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so this summer, it seems like this summer, especially, I mean, it's, it's like the goalposts keep being moved all over the place for this one. I hear people, I see people telling me, oh, 65 degrees, 64 degrees. Well, I only fished in 63 degrees, but I mean, what's your number after, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll ask Trevor again. Mm -hmm. So you, Trevor's, I mean, I've looked into this. I think all of us have looked into this a lot. Uh, Trevor, after, you know, doing a, good bit of research. Mm -hmm. What's your number? I think 68 to 70 degrees I'd be comfortable with in the way that I fish. And, and I'm a, I don't fight fish for a long period of time. Right. I get fish to net within, I would say within 10 seconds, almost all the time. And some of my biggest fish have been my shortest fights because I know what I'm doing from the beginning and I really have to make decisions fast. Um, and so I feel pretty confident with those temperatures and my ability to release that trout safely. Um, some of that goes back to having barbless hooks, which which are allow for a quick release yeah. and keeping the fish in the net rather than pulling it out of the water an extended period of time prior to even taking a picture. I don't, I don't take a lot of pictures of fish um, except for at night and certain, you know, certain other times where I'm with someone, I just haven't, I'm not very well practiced, I guess, at taking them by myself, but I would want to know that I could do it in a quick amount of time. But yeah. yeah, 68 to 70 degrees in Pennsylvania, I think. And and that's, again, I think that this, it has to be tied to the waterways you're fishing, yeah, the state you're fishing in, and what those trout are exposed to on a yearly basis in those streams. Yeah. Anybody else? I I I like the 68, but I think it depends. Yeah. So when I say it depends, if I, if I get there and I'm ready to fish a river at 6 AM and it's at 68 degrees, I'm probably going to leave because oh, yeah. I know that's the, that's yeah. the coldest it's going to be that day. Right. Mm -hmm. So nah, not a good choice. Um, if I get there at, you know, 7 PM and I know that the river's going to cool down at 68 degrees, then I'm, then I'm more likely to fish it. But if it's, it, it depends on that day. If I, if it, let's say the river's at 68 and it's going to be a cool day and the temperatures are going to stay that day and the air temperatures are going to stay in the, let's say around 70 degrees, then I know that that water's not going to fluctuate because at 68, I'm going to have OCD and take the temperature yeah. every every 10 or 15 minutes just to double check myself that I didn't screw something up. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I fished at those temperatures and usually the fishing sucks. I've not had, at least during the day, I can't think back to a day that it was, you know, the water temps were 68 and I crushed fish. So to me, I drive to a different river that yeah. was colder because I think the fishing would be better. I, th I know I've talked to you guys about this a little bit, but um 
in another thing that came up in the research, again, this was, I apologize because I'll keep sharing little tidbits here and there, but across the country in a, in about five different studies, they looked at brown trout feeding behaviors and these were all on hatchery fish. So keep that in mind. Yeah. But in hatchery fish, feeding took place pretty heavily between 12 and 19 degrees Celsius. And some studies went up to 19 and a half degrees Celsius, which I think 19 degrees it's Celsius like is 66, 67. 66, yeah, okay. 67. Yep. Yeah. Right in there. And it steeply dropped after that point. Not, mm-hmm. not gradually. It was like a rock face. The just feeding dropped off. Mean. The feeding dropped yeah. off very, very significantly. Yeah. And that corresponded to a flattening of the growth curve of brown trout mm. that were subjected to those temperatures for extended periods of time. And so I found that pretty interesting as well. And to your point, Bill, I think that being comfortable from a survivability of trout between 68 and 70 is one thing, but also using that knowledge about their feeding behavior to your benefit, you should seek out cooler water for your fishing. Um, but I, but within that question is also the nuance of of where are you fishing in the water column and what type of river are you fishing and does it have depth yeah. because there's a good degree of variation from the top of the water column to the bottom of the water column in rivers that have three or more feet of depth and so and there's a lot of cold water seepage into those lower layers of a lot of our streams and so I do think you might be pulling a 65 degree fish out of a 70 degree temp stream. Mm. Not, not mm. that I'm particularly advocating that, but I'm just saying there's nuance. Yeah, for sure. Even the way you talked earlier about all the other factors that go into it. Let's, let's go ahead, Austin. I say, I know in my local waters, when it gets to be about, you know, 65 plus, your percentage of trout versus chub catch ratio <laughs> right, uh, right. shifts dramatically towards the chub yeah and that's um, just a little bit of a sign there yeah yeah and mm-hmm. once you start catching those you know all right it's not quite there yet you know you might be able to fish for trout but you know it's not quite you know just trout yet because mm-hmm. once it gets cold it's like oh where did all the chubs go in this creek mm-hmm, right. they all leave because <laughs> they just you don't ca- yeah. you don't catch them anymore mm-hmm. um but i think also like you said having variants in the stream bottom and things like that um, dissolved oxygen, which we talked about earlier. Mm. Like when I fished two days ago, I could only catch fish in the riffles because mm. of all that oxygenated oh, yeah. water. For sure. Absolutely. You know, if they were a foot deeper or more, you know, that's where I'd find the fish. I wouldn't mm, find absolutely. them. Even if there was medium paced, deeper water, they just weren't there for me. Right. So I think that is, uh, you know, there's definitely, um, targeted areas to, to think about when fishing in the summertime. Right on. Absolutely. So like Trevor said, I mean, it, it, there's so many different variables to all of this so many nuances. And so it's just really hard to say, okay, 68 or Hey, 67 or no, Hey, you'll be all right at 70. Um, there are, there are a lot of other things. And I really like what you were saying there, Trevor, about like how fast you're fighting them. I mean, Mm -hmm. so let's dig into that. Um, the survival of a trout after you put them back has everything to do with the speed that it's landed and released. Mm -hmm. I believe that wholeheartedly speed is the critical factor. Minimize your time with the trout, and that starts by fighting them fast and fighting them hard. What do you think, guys? Yeah, I think that's a really important point, and I alluded to this earlier, but I think it's good to have a plan for how you're going to fight fish the minute you hook up with a fish. And I see a lot of guys sort of act like it's the first time they've ever caught a fish when they catch a fish, Mm -hmm. and the fish sort of takes advantage of their position whether that be the fisherman being upstream to the fish and having very little leverage or whether it's the fisherman keeping the fish in faster water, keeping it high in the water column. And I think all those are things to maybe flesh out a little bit here, but I think, I think there are, there are important things that you can do from the minute you hook that fish that puts you in the driver's seat. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to experience, but also like proper education. These days you can go on YouTube and watch however many anglers fight fish and, mm. you know, you're watching it and you're just thinking, why are you doing that? Yeah. What are you, you know, doing? I think, I think Bring some them in. Them, yeah. I think some of them think they're fighting it hard. Yeah. Like, oh, I put side pressure on it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Your rod is to the side, but you're not really using it. You know, just turning it to the side doesn't create leverage. It's, right. it's the position of the rod. It's all those things. And like Trevor said, you know, kind of having the instinct of what to do in the moment. 
um, amounts to a lot. And, uh, I think some people just, just don't have the, the education yet. Yeah. Right. And, and they're not going to without experience or that, edu- you know, education to give you a head start. Right. Um, one of the things I have, uh, some of my guided clients do is, well, I, I talk about knowing the strength of your tools. So the tool being your rod yeah. and your tippet, basically mm-hmm. the, the, the weakest thing on your line. So if we're using five X tippet, I'll have guys, I say, here, give me the, you know, maybe we land a few fish and let's say they're mid teens and they are tr- just fighting them way too long. And I mean, I, I want to get them in just because the, the, the longer the fish is on that line, that's more time for him to accidentally get off. So we, mm-hmm. I get my fish in just as quickly, literally as quickly as possible. So anyway, um, I'll have them after, you know, fighting fish for way too long. I'll say, all right, g- give me the, give me the, give me the fly. And I take that fly and I put it on like the, the, the loops of my hemostat. And then I hold the hemostat. So I'm not going to get it hooked. Anyway, I say, all right, start pulling. And they'll pull and they'll pull. And I say, all right, reel in a little bit. Now, now pull, pull harder. And then I pretend I'm a fish and I'm tugging, I'm tugging. And I have That's yet cool. to find somebody who will actually break that 5X tip. Let's say yeah. we're 4X, mm-hmm. 5X we're running. I have yet to find anybody who will break it. They say, I, I feel like I'm going to break the rod. And I, honest <laughs> to God, these are, I get very experienced anglers many times. And even when I do it myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, it takes, you have to flex that rod so much. Let's say we're using a 10 foot four weight on average, you know, right? You have to flex it so much for that 5X tippet to break, you know, mm-hmm. that yeah. four and a half pound tippet to break. And so most people do not know I think it's fair to say most people do not know the strength of the tools in their hand, the rod and that terminal tippet. And so I do that on a regular basis. I just did that with, uh, with Joey. Again, my oldest son, I did, did, did that with him not too long ago. <laughs> he wouldn't break it either hmm. Be, because everybody feels like they're going to you know, do something bad. Nah, hmm. the tippet yeah. will just break. But I, I really think we should know the strength of our tools. Mm-hmm. And how many point. times have you cast it up into a tree? and go on to retrieve it mm. and you can't get it out. And then you point your rod tip straight at it and pull on the line and you still can't get it to snap. Yeah, sure. Right. Like With that no always bend. shocks me. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Things are a lot stronger than we think. So we basically we can fight these fish so much faster than we think we can, even when you're using four X, five X or perhaps six X. Yeah. Yep. Do you think there's a pride aspect or like a fisherman's tail aspect to fighting? Like, well, how long did it take you to fight the fish? And if you tell, I mean, it's like, oh, it took me about five seconds. Yeah. And it's just like, you're, it's a concession that <laughs> what it must kind of not story have been is that, that big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's not exciting. No, I don't know about pride, but yeah, I'm sure in, in, in some vein and in some anglers, there, there's a pride aspect, but I, I really think most people think there should be some fight. Oh, well, I, you know, there's supposed to be a fight next. Oh, I hooked them. Right. And now it took me I'm, two minutes to get them in. Right. And yeah. well, we had a friend who used to send us GoPro videos. He'd go out West, he'd fish and he'd send us GoPro videos of like 15, 16 inch rainbows that he would fight for five, six, seven minutes. And we'd be, we'd be like, just bring them in, just bring them in. Yeah. You know, oh, well, he got downstream <laughs> of me. Don't care. <laughs> Lower the rod to, you know, sideways. So I, I, so, I yeah, go ahead. So the yeah. da- the, the downstream thing. So I think the, mm-hmm. the biggest key to landing a fish quick is closing distance. There hook you that go. Fish, That's awesome. Hook the, hook the fish and get on them. Like, like don't just, it don't hook them and sit back and admire, ah, oh, this is a nice fish and then panic. Right. Where I, I think a lot of the times it's just hook them, roll his head a few times and get on them until he makes a mistake and then have a good, a net with a, a good hoop in it and, you know, roll him over a few times yeah. and get his head up and put the net on him. Don't the, the, the further you, the, the further you are away from the fish, the less chance you have of getting them in a net. There you go. Honestly, Bill, I, yeah, Bill fights fish uh, faster and harder than, I don't know, just about anybody that I've seen. So he's, I, I mean, I, I, I see what you are saying. I see, see him it. chase them out of root balls too on foot. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Bill's like, I got a big fish on. I'm going to get him. I'm mm-hmm. going to get him. Yep. What do you do, Bill, if you hook them downstream? How do you, how do you get that up that downstream angle? I, so if I hook a fish and it ends up downstream, I drop the rod really low yeah. and then I haul ass. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go get and them. I get, I go get them. It's, you know, 
sometimes it's easy and if it's a you know 20 foot wide stream but if it's a yeah you know 200 yard wide stream uh and got big boulders it's not so easy but you're never gonna you know it's either you know the the waiting staff honestly has made a big difference it does i think yeah it makes you faster i always thought the yeah. waiting staff was for old guys and it would slow you down <laughs> yeah i made fun of you for a while and <laughs> I, I, know. Got one. I know but no it, i think it, it it speeds me up now like today on my local very small relatively small stream at low levels i wasn't using it but most times i think it speeds me up hey so i think all this fighting them fast stuff i mean this we're gonna do this this we'll do this we'll really i think break down fighting fish fast in a future podcast cover those details and how to control the fish that we hook uh but for now uh let's move on to the next one the next sort of guiding principle here which is to handle the fish gently so there's a lot to this one, and I think it's what makes beginning anglers most uncomfortable. It's like me with the bluefish or the shark, right? I don't know. I don't know anything about those fish, so I was intimidated to hold them. We never did land a shark, by the way. Uh, but thankfully, <laughs> it's always the one who wants to land a shark. I don't. Uh, but holding a trout isn't all that hard, really. I mean, I mean, they're not the size of a shark. They don't have the uh, teeth that a shark does, all that stuff. To me, it's not that hard. Um, Handling them gently uh, means a few things. Uh, first, do not squeeze the trout. Don't squeeze a trout. Cradle them instead. Cradle them. Put your hands around them. If you're going to feel more comfortable, if you aren't, if you aren't squeezing them, um, try turning them upside down to take the hook out. I mean it. Invert the trout, and often they calm down. Mm. Um, especially brown trout. Yeah, uh, unless they're a rainbow. I was, Rainbows exactly, never calm down. Exactly. We used to, uh, I've said this before. Um, it's like brown trout have a measure of self-respect. And they go, all right, all right, all right, you got me. All right, just to get this hook out, let's get it over with. Put me back. And rainbow trout are going, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And they just shake and roll. And, yeah, it's yeah. so true. I think yeah. brookies are somewhere in the middle, but I I, I find that my, mo, mo, most brookies and, and browns will... will Relax a little bit or calm mm -hmm. down if you invert them. Anyway, um, also, obviously, I think wet your hands. I think most of us know this. Wet your hands if you're going to touch a trout. And, but keep them in the water as much as possible. I mean, the, the idea of keep them wet is good. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Keep them. That's where they're supposed to be. You know? So what do you think, guys? Yeah, I see. I think I see a lot of guys take the hook out, out of the water. And I think that's one of those times that you can just be really conscious about keeping them in the water for you know put them in the net i think guys some maybe they don't have a big enough net sometimes but keep them in the net have and just take the hook out in the net i think with a barbless hook there's no reason you shouldn't get good at just one hand kind of just inverting that hook and just popping it out um and that's just a silly time to be stressing the fish by keeping it out of the water yeah to get that hook out quickly mm-hmm yeah. That's just a really comfortable cradle. You know, it's a lot more comfortable than the palm of your hand, which is pretty unstable. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I, I think one thing, you know, if you, let's say you're having a good day and you're, you're catching fish. Yeah. Um, there are times when I'll purposely lose a fish, mm -hmm. but you know, let's say I've caught a dozen 12 inch fish and there's no reason to catch you know, or, no, or not the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> but, 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 you know, get him, get him close. And, uh, if it's a barbless hook, a lot of times you can, you can let off pressure and the hook will pop out. You don't even have to net the fish. Yeah. Especially the small ones. I mean, really, that's the best place to lose them is like right at your feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next, you know, yep. Especially in the winter. Counts on the ticker. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. A good that's point. really true. That's right. I think a big part of it is, if you're going to take a picture, also get them in position underwater. Mm -hmm. you know, don't try to get them in position once they're out of the water and in your hands. Cause be really comfortable with what you do when you're holding a fish. Right. If it's a, two, if it's a two hand fish, know exactly what you're going to do. If it's a one hand fish, know exactly what you're going to do. Be really comfortable with that. Sure. And then when yeah. they're in the water, get them into position. So all you got to do is lift. You know, right. they're already calm in the water in your hands. You lift, you put them back down. Yeah. So all of this about handling, I mean, I think the first reason we have to handle the fish is to get the, get the hook out, right? So yeah. barbless hooks, I think most of us are on board with that. I've struggled with even micro barbs on streamers. I mean, I pinch them down now on my night flies. I pinch them down. Mm -hmm. It honestly, I started doing it for my own sake more than the fish at first, but now I realize how much easier just it is to just 
get that get that hook out of the fish and that's why we have to handle them um mm-hmm. for the most part i mean if things go right then it's an it's an easy thing um but i think it me- also means having your tools ready for me it's hemostats i mean so as soon as i realized that the oh man okay so this is an articulated streamer maybe and it, oh he's got one hook here and one hook there so i don't really mess around with i'm gonna do this with my fingers no I kind of keep the trout in the net. You know, if, if I can do this, I'm going to keep the trout kind of in the net, mostly submerged. Maybe its gills are still working. And I get my hemostats, boom, get it, get one hook out, get the other hook mm-hmm. out. They're both barbless and I should be gone. I mean, yeah, yeah. this is easy though for us to say, but we've all done this thousands of times, yeah. you know? And so if you're not comfortable with it, I think it's okay to recognize that. And I mean, I don't think I mean, anybody needs to feel bad about it. Um, yeah. Try to do your best. What we're trying to do is, understand you know i'm learning from all of you guys as you talk about it and uh you know just, we're just trying to minimize that time trying to handle them gently i think the first time that you uh experience what poor handling can do to a fish also mm. uh has a pretty big impact there i remember i remember years ago a couple years ago now i was in montana and i was having a great day of streamer fishing and i still had that mindset of well I'm streaming fishing. I'll I'll keep somewhat of a barb, you know. If there's a big one, maybe it won't come yeah. off. Yeah, and that was my mindset, and you know, the whole day that worked out fine until the end of the day when I had a, a really beautiful brown trout of good size just totally swallow the thing, and mm-hmm. it took me way too long to get it out. And you know, in that situation, sometimes the only way to remove your fly is by it, it just tears the tissue out of them and yeah. it causes severe bleeding. And the moment that starts happening, it's like. I don't know. It's just the most, to me, it was just such a sad thing. Like I never felt like I was the villain of a trout stream before <laughs> and that like I was their enemy all of a sudden, you know, the whole day I felt like I was, you know, part of the stream, you know, working with them, um, enjoying their presence. And then I went ahead and killed one and I just felt like I had no place to be there anymore. And I will never put a barb on a streamer again after watching it float belly up downstream. That's a good story. I mean, so you learned your lesson there. And yeah. I, I mean, so that's a lesson I had for to you. Stop fishing for the day. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not even going to tell everybody, oh, if you are fishing with a barb on a streamer, you're a bad person. You know, I mean, if, if people choose to do that, all right, get it out quick though, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I know what you mean. I've, I've accidentally killed fish. I mean, but I've right. been fishing for whatever, almost 35 years or something like that. And it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. So let's move on. Uh, release quickly is uh, sort of the last one. Um, so what is quick? Well, we can land most top tier fish in under a minute. Trevor said it earlier. He feels like he can do it, he can do it in, well, in just a few seconds um, or uh, under a half minute, right? And I think we can release those fish in just a few seconds. Pop the hook out, right? I mean, if everything goes smoothly, you can release a trout in just a few seconds like we were talking about. Everyone kind of agrees with that if things go right. But I guess the question is more to the point about this release quickly guideline is about fish pictures. And I've made my thoughts known in the articles that I've written. And I believe that photos are an important part of fly fishing. Uh, They are the grand compromise of catch and release. That's what I say. So I don't agree with the recent push to eliminate pictures altogether or to only take photos under the water. I mean, it's nuanced though, right? Like we've talked about. But if an angler wants to document their catch to take a photo um don't take that away from them given first of all that that all the other things have gone well in the process those things like like we're talking about like fish cold water check i did that fight them fast i fought them real fast i got them in in like 30 seconds and handled gently okay i got the hook out real quickly and then the five seconds out of the water for a photo is fine it really is it really is And I do mean five seconds. You can keep the trout in cold, moving water, like Josh was just talking about, knowing how you're going to hold the trout, kind of holding them under the water as his gills are moving in this cold, again, moving water. And then you can do that while the camera is, while the camera is being prepared, whether it's you or uh, a buddy, right? And then lift the fish for five seconds, snap the photo, release. Bye-bye. You know, thanks for playing. If five seconds is possible. I mean, I, good guideline. Josh, I, I think... Go ahead. Go ahead Trevor. I was just going to ask you and Josh both 
what you guys do to your cameras to kind of set yourselves up to take five second photos? Cause I know both of you can do it easily. I, so I use, I use video for mine. And so if you have a camera that can do that, it's a really efficient way of doing it. Cause you're going to have a lot of frames that you can pull from. And most of the time for the compression that's happening on Instagram, they're plenty big enough to still have a really, really crisp photo. So mess around with your video stuff. Don't try to, don't try to figure out focus with a, with a camera necessarily. Sometimes some, some cameras you have to, but I use video for mine when I'm alone and it works really, really well. And I get sharp pictures and I can choose which drip I like the best. Mm -hmm. and, which drip. Yeah. Cause if they're not yeah. dripping, it's, they've been out of the water for too long. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Then I'm a villain. Yeah. <laughs> then you're the villain. <laughs> Bill, you're good at it. Yeah, Bill, you really are good at it. I got a little bit of a longer process as far as just, so first off, if I get to the stream, I'd like to, I'd rather set my camera up. Uh, as far as the settings go on it, I try to set it up beforehand so that I know what I'm getting into. And then uh, the, the tripod I keep on a belt behind me on a Velcro uh, homemade Velcro setup where I can get to the tripod quickly. I just unstrap the Velcro yeah. and then the, the cameras on the belt, you just swing it around easy access. And so let's say 10 seconds, I have the tripod and the camera out it's up. And then I'd like to look for a place on the bank that has depth so that I can put the net, a deep, like a deep weld net, um, put, put that in. I prefer a little bit slower moving water because then you're not, then the fish isn't getting kind of washed against the net. Yeah. There um, you go. So the gills yeah. can keep moving. Yeah. Good so call. It, and, and it's, you know, the big basket, you know, floating most nets, most nets float now. So it's almost yeah. at that point, you've got like a 20 by 20 live well for that fish. Yeah. And then, you know, plop it on the bank. Uh, the DSLRs or mirrorless cameras have, focus points in them and so for the longest time i got horrible pictures because when you click on the button to kind of kick off a timer for a, D a dslr mm. it focus it focuses at that point and so when it focuses if you're leaning forward it focuses on your forehead you back up and then you take a crappy photo mm, okay. and so yeah. then you you know you're like i got a crappy photo i gotta take another one and then you know, that process goes on here. Like there's gotta yep. be a better way. And so, uh, the, the biggest game changer for me was a remote shutter for my camera yeah. and you can just, you know, put it in your mouth, hold it in your finger, whatever you want to do. Um, so one, you don't need a timer because if you get into like a DSLR, or even your phone and you kick off a timer, that timer is 10 seconds. So that's, that's at that point, you're, you're holding the fish out of the water 10 seconds and then it starts to take the photo. And so if you have a remote shutter, as soon as you click that shutter, it takes the photo. Yeah. And so you pick the, you pick the fish out of the net, click it a few times. Mm. And another key thing was the uh, flip screen. So the flip screen allows you to see where the focus point is. So you pick up the fish, you put it on that focus dot. You click it a few times, you got your photo, and away goes the fish. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a big process, but it, in the end, it, it's quick. It's like there's an art to it, really. I mean, I don't know about mm -hmm. an art, but there's a process to it, which you just described, and that's cool. And my yeah. process is simpler because I just use my phone. phone for. I still re usually use my phone and a remote shutter, Bluetooth remote shutter. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't get the kind of photos that you guys do, selfies, you know. There's But there's mm -hmm. a there's a real process or an art to what you just described. Um, one of the main things I, I want to point out, or I want to clarify though, what you're talking about, all that setup happens while the trout is in the water yeah. still. Mm, I mean, yeah. you mentioned earlier about a floating net. I mean, I, yeah. that's what I'm always talking. I, I've recommended that a thousand times, get a net that floats so that it is yeah. like a live well. Now you're not going to keep them in there for a half hour, but for those 30 seconds, maybe even a minute of setup for that DSLR up on the bank and whatnot, that trout 
is just fine. Its gills are moving. It's in cold, moving water. You know? Yep. Yeah. I think it's fine. Yeah, don't, throw, don't throw that fish on the bank. Oh my right, gosh. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> my yeah. process is that focus point thing. And I've had to develop my own formula for that through the years. But I always check if I can't get it perfectly focused within two max, three tries. Yeah. I just let it go. You know, You're done. I just forget about the picture. I don't right. need it that bad. Right. And that has to do with priorities. What are our pri priorities? You know? And I, I think yeah. you got to be disciplined. It's like we all fish during the spawn during the, 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 the fall spawn, but we don't, we don't, we don't target spawning trout. I, but you have to have that discipline, right? But I seriously will go, oh my, that's a big trout. Yeah, nice one. And I'll just walk past. I'm not going to fish for them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, likewise, if I can't get a shot within one or two lifts, okay, bye-bye. You know, yeah. yep. I, there is, you know, some ethics and some discipline to mm -hmm. it. And we can't make that decision for everybody. Yeah. One thing I've always liked about your guys' photos too is I think a lot of them don't have your face in them. You know, you're just you're focused yeah. on taking the photo of the fish. You kind of, and I think that's a simpler process, you know, than it is to try to get everything into the same frame. You know? Yep, and always keep them as close to the water as you can. You know, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you can take a picture of a really you, know, you can take a really cool picture of a fish with its with its face still somewhat in the water. You know, right, right. Like it doesn't always have to be fully I like those. out. That, yeah. Those are my favorite, I think. Yep. Like the half submerged fish. Right. Just, yeah, it I think looks, they look really good. It looks, that's, that's what a fish should be is in the water. That's neat. We had an instance, uh, what was it, three weeks ago, Trevor? We were night fishing together mm -hmm. and it was, it had been a relatively productive night and mm -hmm. it was not to, not to boast, but I think it was the second <laughs> whiskey of the night that we were into, yeah. but it took a little bit longer. And, yeah. uh, yeah. like flopping around, we had to get it. It was a little bit too big for my little net and we had to get into his net and doing that, it hit its head off the net. And then we had to get the hook. It, it, like he was just, he was flipping out. It took a little bit longer to get the hook out than we wanted. And by the end of it, we're like, this isn't, this isn't worth it. He's a 20 inch fish, but we're going to let him go. Yeah. Right. It wasn't yeah. really worth it. You know, we're like, I like this, it. Is, this has been hard enough on him as it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to keep your priorities straight. And I yeah. think we felt good about that decision. Sure. Yeah. So there's another topic right there, just taking fish pictures that, I mean, we can seriously, and maybe we will in the future, do a whole podcast on. Um, but those principles of fish in cold water, fighting them fast, handle them gently and release quickly. I think that's where, I think that's enough. You know what I mean? I think if, if, yeah. if you follow that as, as well as you can, um, then you, and if you're doing your best, truly doing your best, there you go. Uh, one more thing though. All right. So before we wrap this up, every time I pub publish an article on this topic, I inevitably get some of the same feedback. Or if I start talking about it, I, I always get the same feedback. I have people telling me that, sure, you and I can take pictures of these trout by these standards, but the beginners can't or that most anglers won't. So basically they say, don't tell people the truth and don't give anglers too much credit. This one really gets to me. I mean, the industry itself and so many anglers on the experienced side of things sort of routinely underestimate the average angler, in my view. So they, so people will tell me, hey, don't say 68 degrees, say 65 instead. Or just tell people not to take pictures because they won't hold the trout carefully enough anyway. But that's so elitist. Every one of us was inexperienced at some point. And in many ways, we still are. And I, and I think it's a better strategy to just educate people, like hopefully we're doing here. We're learning from each other. Share ideas. We're sharing, we're sharing our failures and our experiences. And we all learned what way? The hard way, right? Everybody learned the hard way. Austin gave an example of, uh, of a fish that he hooked deeply. We've all done that. You couldn't get the, couldn't get the, couldn't get the hook out and whatnot. Everyone has to make those mistakes and it's the only way to get there. And so I, I think tell the people the truth about, and, and the scientific facts about the, about the water temperatures, for example, and let everyone learn for themselves, but they can go into it with good information. I like that a lot. I think you and I talked about this earlier, Dom, but I think if you can marry a little bit of the science behind what we're talking about with your experience on the stream, 
I think you come up with a really good and safe kind of threshold for yourself. And I don't think any of us are saying that if you as an angler want to limit things at 65 after doing all those things, that that's a bad thing. But I think that it's important to be a conscientious angler and a yeah. curious angler and to be a student of the fish that you're fishing for. And, you know, I think, I don't know what you guys would say, but I think when I catch a fish that's, that's clearly stressed in water, that's too warm. Yeah. That says something to me, certainly. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it gives me feedback that, that, I mean, Hey, maybe I shouldn't be fishing here right now. And, and maybe I walk yep. through in my mind, did I fish? Did I catch that fish quickly? Did I take the hook out quickly? Did I, you know, if I run through all that and I still come up with a 68 degree water fish that looked too stressed to me, I might uh, give that pause and change positions, change locations, you know, cause there might be something else going on in that water that's stressing those fish, whether that's, it's been 68 for a week, you know, and now they're not so happy with it. Or there's a pollutant yeah. in that water that's stressing them out mm -hmm. in addition to the temperature, you know? So I think you just, what I think we're all trying to get away from is this formulaic approach to say, here is the exact cutoff and this is always what it's going to be. Sure. You need to, you need to have nuance to your approach. Yeah. And all the other elements that go with it, handling them, you know, mm -hmm. with care, fighting them fast and all that stuff. This is probably a good platform also to encourage if we're talking about and to newer anglers to, to follow the same principles that, that we talk about in, in the rest of trout bitten is know your system and mm -hmm. the same way you practice your knots, mm -hmm. practice taking pictures, you know, mm -hmm. and that could sure. be on really cold days, take pictures of small fish. They're not going to be mm -hmm. stressed. <laughs> you know, they take two or, seconds to get in the net, take, take a picture of them, oh. you know, uh, I I'll practice on Coke bottles. Yeah, for real. In my in my, oh, no, in my living yeah. room. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> like you're you know just hold something in your hand and figure out how to take that photo. Practice. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. It, it's the same thing with. Uh, I think a lot of it is a learning learning experience. You have to yeah. You have to experience time on the water catching fish and get comfortable with all of it, and it's not going to come in two hours a month. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have to you know, spend time on the water and have those experiences and know what works well for you and you're going to make mistakes. And that's, I try not to criticize other people yeah. because I have a decade of photos that are just fish on bank from when I was first starting to fish until I was in my twenties yeah. because I didn't know any better. Yeah. And Good then point. you, you, you get older and you start to learn and you know, the, the photos get better and the, they look better and the fish look better. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. you catch them again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. When they're, when they're bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Godspeed get bigger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great summary, bud. All right. So thanks guys. Good conversation. Let's do it again soon. Uh, thanks to everyone out there who's listening. If you have ideas, questions uh, that you'd like us to answer or topics you'd like to hear covered, get in touch with us. Uh, and remember, troutbitten.com is a free resource for all anglers. I hope you'll dig in and check it out. Navigate through the menus and find what you like. Share it. Leave a comment. Use the search page if you're looking for something specific. Navigate by way of the categories and tags too. Thank you so much for listening. Please rate this podcast on iTunes and leave a comment. That does help. Until next time, friends. Fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life on the water. <laughs>